Hey, how are you? My name is Jessica and you're in our Vegas PBS STEAM Camp Science Lab. STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And these aren't just subjects you learn in school. STEAM helps improve our lives and our community. Today, with the help of experts, you and I are going to learn about the STEAM that is all around us in Southern Nevada, some you might have never even thought about before. Then, I'm going to show you some fun activities that you can do at home to learn more. You'll even have the chance to send me pictures or videos of your results, but I'll talk about that a little later in the show. To get started, all I need is a question. There it is, my ring. That means I'm getting a video call. Oh, it's Xenia. Hey Xenia, how are you doing? Do you have a question that you would like to ask on today's Vegas PBS STEAM Camp Show? Hey Jessica, I was wondering how we predict the weather. Perfect question. Let's visit my friend at the National Weather Service in Las Vegas to learn more. Hi everybody, my name is Trevor Boucher. I'm a meteorologist at the National Weather Service office here in Las Vegas. You're probably wondering what do we do here at the National Weather Service? Well, we're keeping our eyes on the skies at all times. So here in the United States, we actually have a lot of really unique weather, so much so that people come to study the weather here from other countries. Things like tornadoes, hurricanes, we have droughts, we have all sorts of different things that happen around here. But what happens here in the desert? Those are different. We don't necessarily have tornadoes like you would have in the Midwest, but there are weather hazards that we have to be paying attention to. For instance, in the desert, what's the number one thing you think of? Heat. You may not think of it every day, and it may not be dangerous because you're used to it, but sometimes when you start getting into the triple digits, that starts to become a danger. If you're running around outside and it's 120 degrees outside, you're gonna feel it, and we need to let you know those days when it's gonna be particularly dangerous. We also have thunderstorms that happen here. You may not see them very frequently. You can get the moisture from hurricanes that are out in the Pacific, and when they come this way and there's all this heat, you can start to have thunderstorms because heat rises and that is what causes all of our issues in the first place. So it's one thing to forecast the weather, it's another to observe what's actually happening. So what you actually see behind me is how we measure the wind. We have both an anemometer, which is the little ping pong thing that spins around, that measures wind speed. And then we have a wind vane, which is the little wing thing that you see behind me. And that changes direction with the direction of the wind. So they measure two different things about what's happening with the wind, but both of those things are important because it gives us the whole picture about what the wind is doing and how it's going to impact things. So another way that we observe the weather is to track how much rain has fallen. Now we have the cylinder that's right here, and this is how we catch all that rain. So for order for us to be able to uh, measure it, we need to have a measuring stick, and we're able to just put it right here in the cylinder to get an idea of how much rain fell, how much stacked up over time. And so if we take this out right now, we can see that inside of it, we actually have another little cylinder. What this does, it overflows when there's a lot of rain, it falls back into here, and then we can measure how much filled in here, pour this back into this, measure it again, and add those things up to get the total amount of rain that actually fell. And that's really important for us to know exactly how much rain had fallen. And at that point, whether or not that was normal, or was that above normal, or was it below normal? And it gives us the idea of whether or not this is something that could be impactful to you and whether it could be dangerous. So right here over my shoulder, we have a thermometer. Now you probably have seen thermometers before with the mercury that goes up and down with the little red liquid inside. That's one way to have a thermometer, but you can also have digital thermometers like this behind us. It doesn't look like the same thing that you've normally seen, but it's sheltered. See this honeycomb thing that you see behind me? That's on purpose. It protects it from direct sunlight, which may skew the temperatures up or down depending on how much it's directly impacted by sun. So before we get the balloon up in the air, we actually have to tie it to a piece of instrumentation. This device is called a radio sonde. It's got all sorts of different pieces of information on it that allows you to understand what the weather's doing. So we have a thermometer, we have a hygrometer, which measures the moisture, and then we also have a barometer on it, which measures the pressure. So all of these things together tell us a number of different things about what it looks like in the upper atmosphere. So we tie this to the balloon, the balloon goes up, and then we get all the data that's fed directly into our computer systems inside talked about a lot of different ways to observe the atmosphere, but all of those things we talked about were on the ground. Now these balloons are going up all over the country, 
all at the exact same time. So we're gonna go launch it and we're gonna see what it looks like. So we're back inside now. Remember that big balloon that we just launched in the air? Well, now we're getting the data coming in right now live. This balloon with all the other balloons in the country are giving us this information live so that we can put it into our weather models and produce the best forecast. So that's all we got here to show you here at the National Weather Service. So we hope that you had a good time and you learned something in the process. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Trevor. Let's review what we learned. Meteorologists forecast severe weather in our community, like extreme heat and thunderstorms, so we can prepare and stay safe. Weather instruments help meteorologists observe and measure the weather, including wind speed, temperature, and rain. The National Weather Service launches weather balloons across the country at the same time every day to measure conditions high in the atmosphere. A weather instrument, called a radio sonde, is attached to the weather balloon. The radio sound sends information to computers to help forecast the weather. Now it's our turn to think like scientists and observe and describe the wind in your neighborhood. Here in Nevada, we get a lot of wind. We can't actually see the wind, but when it's windy, I notice that tree branches are swaying, clouds are moving, and leaves are blowing across the ground. That makes me wonder, how can I measure the speed of the wind in my neighborhood? So here's the plan you're going to build an anemometer, kind of like the ones we saw at the National Weather Service, to measure the wind. Then you're going to record the speed of the wind over several days and see how the weather changed. To do this, you're going to need five small cups, two straws, a push pin, a pencil, a marker, and a hole punch. And if you don't have a hole punch, it's okay. Just ask a grown-up to punch holes using the tip of a sharpened pencil. To make your anemometer, take one of the cups and punch four holes right under the rim. These holes are going to be opposite of one another. Then take your straw and slide them through the holes, just like this. When you put them through the holes, your straws should make a big plus sign. Next, color one of your remaining cups with a marker. This will make it easier to track the number of spins your anemometer makes in the wind. I colored mine with a little blue-green spot. Then, next you'll need to punch two holes next to each other on the rest of the cups. These holes will be about halfway down the side, just like this. You can mark your holes with a marker right before you start to make sure you punch them in just the right place. Now, it's time to place the cups on the anemometer. You'll do this by threading them through each end of the straw, just like this. When you have one cup in, Repeat the process with all four remaining cups and make sure that all of your cups face the same direction so that they work in the wind. Then push a pencil through the bottom, just like that. Take your pencil out and flip it over and push it in so that the eraser touches your plus sign. Once you do that, take your push pin and secure your eraser to where your straws cross. Now you're ready to measure the wind. Ask a family member to help you keep track of 15 seconds on your stopwatch while you count how many times your anemometer spins. Focus your attention on the cup you colored and that will help you keep track of your counts on a windy day. You'll also need to track your results on a chart, just like this one. In one column, write the date that you're taking your measurement. In the next column, write where you took the measurement. Maybe it was in your front yard or your backyard. Then write the number of spins in 15 seconds in the last column. After a week or so, study your chart. Did you notice any patterns? How did the weather change after a windy day? And why do you think that is? Was one location better at measuring the wind than another? Why? Now let's check in with Xenia who's doing this activity at home right now. Hey Xenia, how's it going? Hi Jessica, here's my anemometer. The materials that I used for an my anemometer were some little cups, um, one push pin, a pencil, and it has to have an eraser so you can put it in the push pin. I tested my anemometer with my friend. And I also tested my anemometer outside. 
and it spun only a few times if it was windy. If it wasn't windy, then it didn't spin at all. Now, let's check in with Luis, who's doing this activity at home right now. Hey Luis, how's it going? Hi Jessica. So, how I build my anemometer was I put one cup and I put two straws in each of these cups, four cups. Then I put some yellow circle stickers for to count how many spins there are. And I attach the, the straws in, in these four cups and I put a, a pin there and a pencil. I tracked my backyard on 0615 and the number of spins was in 15 seconds was nine. So I'm gonna turn on the fan and you'll see. And you can see it's spinning. And I count these circles to see how many spins. Great job building your anemometer and also really good job collecting your data. Thanks for sharing your work. An important part of being a scientist is sharing your work with others. Visit our website at vegaspbs.org slash steamcamp to submit videos or pictures of your results to me at Vegas PBS with your grown-ups permission. We will post some of your projects on our website and if your project is selected, we will mail you a cool PBS Kids bag and a new book. When you visit our website, you'll also find a copy of the chart that we use to keep track of our data and links to PBS Kids shows and activities to learn more about the weather. Speaking of learning more, one of the best ways to learn more about a topic is to check out a book. Let's visit the library and discover some more books that can help you learn about the weather. It's so good to be here with you today. I heard that you learned a lot about the weather from the National Weather Service. My name is Miss Shanna, and I'm a librarian here at the Windmill Library. I'm here to share with you some cool books about the weather. The first book I have to share with you is called The Weather Girls by Aki. And it's a really fun book that talks about the weather through the four seasons. And the weather girls are really fun. We have Laura, Annie, Jane, June, Miffy, Rebecca, Vanessa, Melanie, Sarah, Lucy, Kathleen, Zoe, Kirsten, Joy, Tilly, and Emily. Maybe one of your names matches their names. And they go through the four seasons all throughout the book. Now there are four seasons and the Weather Girls talk about their favorite things to do, going to spring and going to the park, um, going up through the hot air balloons and the rainbows that you can see. And there's some fun facts about all the seasons. We have summer, we have fall, we have spring, and we have winter. And to learn more about the seasons, you can read this book. This is called Maker Lab Outdoors. And this is a DK book from the Smithsonian. That's a really cool museum. And what's really great about this book is it has experiments about the weather. In fact, there's a whole chapter devoted to a world of weather. You can make a barometer, a rain gauge, a thermometer, cracking rocks. If you want to get deeper into doing this and do one with your family, I highly recommend you check out this book. And you can check out more books at lvccld.org or your local library. And don't forget to check out our summer programs. Welcome back to the Vegas PBS STEAM Camp Science Lab. We have so much more investigating still to come. I just need to wait for another question. <gasps> there it is. Let me answer this video call. Oh, it's Luis. Hi Luis, do you have another question for the STEAM Camp? Hi Jessica, I was wondering why do we build dams? That's a fantastic question. And I have a friend who works at Hoover Dam that can help answer it. Let's go talk to them. Hi kids, I'm Natalie Starfish. I'm one of the engineers that works at Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam is 726 feet tall. That is taller than two Statues of Liberty stacked on top of each other. Hoover Dam is holding back Lake Mead and below us is the Colorado River. 
Hoover Dam dams up the Colorado River. The Colorado River is what formed the Grand Canyon. That is some strong water moving that canyon around, digging that hole, moving all the rocks around. And that's the, the river that we need to hold back. So now let's take a look at the riverside, the Colorado River. The water from the Colorado River before they built the dam was very unreliable. We had floods, we had droughts. People couldn't water their farms. They couldn't keep crops alive. They couldn't, they couldn't keep themselves alive. It was a very, very tough time. People wanted a more reliable way to have water so that they could do those things. And that's the reason they built Hoover Dam. The Bureau of Reclamation manages three dams in this area. We've got Parker, Davis, and Hoover Dam. First, we're gonna talk about Parker Dam. Parker Dam was built in 1938, just after Hoover Dam was built, and it even makes electricity. In front of Parker Dam is Lake Havasu. Moving upriver is Davis Dam. Davis Dam holds back Lake Mojave. Lake Mojave and Davis Dam are right near Laughlin, Nevada and Bullhead City, Arizona. Davis Dam was completed in 1951 and it's a great place to visit. Davis Dam is an earth-filled dam where we use rocks and dirt and water and we make this tight, squishy formation to make an embankment dam. Davis Dam makes electricity just like Hoover and Parker. So now let's go upstream and take a look at Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam was completed in 1935. It was also built during the Great Depression. We had thousands of people come out here to work at Hoover Dam. They brought their families as well. So the Colorado River is what we dammed up. So how we hold it back is we've got a gravity arch dam. So it's, it's shaped like a big arch. And what happens is when the water pushes against that dam, it pushes up against our canyon walls. And it also pushes the, the whole dam down. So it's pushing down and, a, and out. And that's what holds the force of the water back. If the dam was faced the other way, like this, the water would just push it right over. And we would have water everywhere, which is not the idea of a dam. We need to be holding that water back. Welcome to Lake Mead. Lake Mead is the largest reservoir man's ever made in the United States. It is 112 miles long, 528 feet deep. That holds a lot of water. Our water from Las Vegas comes from Lake Mead. The Lake Mead water is delivered to Arizona, California, Mexico, and of course, Nevada. Lake Mead has enough water to fill the entire state of Nevada five inches deep, or Clark County, where we're from, five foot. That's right about there. That is a lot of water. That's probably taller than most of you guys. Thank you for coming out and joining Hoover Dam with me today and finding out what happens with our water here in the West how we take care of it, how we get it to our neighbors in Mexico, how we get it to our other state neighbors in California and, and Arizona. There's so many books about Hoover Dam and Parker and Davis. Please dive into them, find out more. I'm always learning as well. It was fun being with you here today. Bye-bye. Thanks, Natalie. Let's review what we learned. Hoover Dam was built to make water from the Colorado River more reliable, so there's always enough water when people need it. When Hoover Dam was built, the Colorado River flooded the canyons behind the dam, creating Lake Mead, a reservoir. A reservoir is a lake where water is stored for future use. Hoover Dam is made of strong materials like concrete, so water can't go through it. Hoover Dam is also an arch gravity dam which means the arch shape is using gravity to hold the water back. Now it's our turn to think like engineers and build our own dams. In order to do this, we are going to use the engineering design process. All engineers start their work by coming up with a goal or a problem they want to solve. Your challenge will be to design a dam across the middle of a container that is both waterproof and strong enough to withstand the pressure of water. You will add water to one side of the pan, creating a reservoir to see if it holds back the water. To do this, you will need to use your imagination and make a plan. You can build your dam in an aluminum baking pan or a small plastic bin. Then gather different building materials. You might want to use sand or dirt, rocks, craft sticks, but these aren't the only things you can use. Be creative and see what else you can find inside and outside of your home. You will also need a large cup of water to test your dam. Then compare the strengths and weaknesses of the materials you chose. How are you going to use them in your design? Are they going to be strong enough to hold back the water? Draw a sketch of your design before you start. The next step is to create your dam. 
take your time and test the pieces as you go, because testing your project as you go is a great way to save time and fix mistakes if you realize something isn't quite working. After you've created your dam, add water to one side of the pan and see what happens. Does the dam hold back the water, forming a reservoir? If so, great job. Maybe it can support even more water. Add some more and see what happens. But if you tested your dam and it leaked or collapsed, it's okay. Just think about what you can do to make your bridge stronger. Then improve it and then test again. Now, let's check in with Luis, who's doing this activity at home right now. Luis, how's it going? Hi, Jessica. This is my plan I drew for the dam. So the materials I used, there are two of them. There's some rocks and I used a piece of cardboard. I picked them because they would they would look like a, a dam because the rocks are being blocked by the cardboard. Now I'm gonna test my dam with this blue water to make it a reservoir. It looks like my experiment didn't work. Next time um I'll maybe add some more rocks. Now Let's check in with Xenia, who's doing this activity at home right now. Hey Xenia, how's it going? Hi Jessica, today I'm going to make a dam made out of rocks, sticks, mud, and popsicle sticks. I'm trying to make sure that the water doesn't go on this side, so I'm going to try to pour some water. So my dam kind of worked, but I still notice a little bit of water on this side, so I can improve it with maybe some more sticks or some more mud or some more rocks. Great job following the engineering design process. And thanks for sharing your work. Kids, sharing is a really important step in the engineering design process, and I want you to share your dams with me. You can submit a picture or a video of your finished project to me at our website at vegaspbs.org slash steamcamp with your grown-ups permission. And remember, if you're submitting a video, make sure I can see what you're doing and hear what you're saying. Also, you'll want to keep your video to one minute or less. We will select some projects for our website, and if we choose yours, you'll get a cool PBS kids bag and a brand new when you visit our website, you'll also find the steps of the engineering design process that you will need to follow to build your dam and links to PBS Kids shows and activities to learn more. Now, I'm going to send it back to the library one more time to discover books you can check out to help you learn more about different kinds of dams and the problems they solve. My name is Ms. Shanna and I'm a librarian here at the Windmill Library and I heard you learned about dams today, how to construct them and how they work. And I'm here to talk to you about several books that we have at the library that you can learn more about dams, especially one of the ones here in Nevada, the Hoover Dam. So this is a book called Building the Hoover Dam and it's all about the history of how our dam was constructed. And it's got all kinds of neat facts about building the dam, where it is, um, how it was constructed, and some really cool stuff. So if you want to learn more about building the Hoover Dam and how that happened, please take a moment to check out this book. This is written by Rebecca Stefoff, and you can check it out at one of our libraries. If you'd like to do some more experiments about canals and dams, you can check out this book, which is called Canals and Dams with 25 Science Projects for Kids. So you can do a lot of these cool experiments at home with your family. So of course there's more experiments about dams and all kinds of neat stuff. Lots of stuff that you'd have at home. Um, this one, for example, just uses a water bottle, push pin masking tape, um, and this a disposable cup, scissors, a turkey baster, all kinds of cool stuff that you probably have sitting at home. So I would definitely recommend checking out a book like this if you wanna learn more about the science behind canals and dams. And then we also have this really neat story called The Dam by David Almond, illustrated by Levi Pinfold. And this is a really beautiful story about 
what happens when a town gets covered up by a dam. And we have one of those towns here in Nevada, out by Overton. And you can actually go out there and look around and see the ruins of a town that was once covered by the water and now is now uncovered. And you can look around and see all the remains. And it's really cool stuff. So I highly recommend you check out one of these books. Go to lvccld.org, find more resources or your local library and ask about one of our summer programs. Thank you so much.